Hey everybody, this is Adam Broad of Liberationus Republicae coming to you from the Voluntary Virtues Network as brought to you by Michael Shanklin. Thanks again, Michael. I'm just going to keep brown nose on you for the whole time every time I have to pull up a video for you. I've got a special guest as recommended to me uh, by our former Letters to Liberty host, Anand Venegala. Um, the, uh, this gentleman, Norman Horn, uh, he holds a Ph.D. in chemical engineering from the University of Texas at Austin and a Master of Arts in Theological Studies from the Austin Graduate School of Theology. This man is currently super psycho busy. I mean, let's be honest. He's a chemical process engineer at Frontier Nanosystems, a polymer membrane science specialist, uh, a worship minister at the UA Church of Christ, as well as founder and editor of LibertarianChristians.com. He's won numerous awards for his writings and research in both engineering and theology, Norman uh, has also published uh, multiple peer-reviewed uh, papers in science, economics, and political theory, and has been published in many popular venues such as the Young American Revolution, LewRockwell.com, and Washington Post. Is there anything I've missed? How are you able to do all of this stuff? I mean, break it down for us. <laughs> well, I guess first of all, I'd say it just takes a, at least some measure of time management skills in order to do this. But you know, you plan your life carefully, and you can do some pretty amazing things with uh, with very scarce resources at times. I had the great privilege of being able to do a lot of this while in graduate school at University of Texas, and uh, it was really an exciting time, and had a lot of encouragement from very good people, both in my church, my parents, my wife. And uh, we've had we've had a lot of success in that, and and thus, uh, you know, I'm I'm very pleased with the result thus far, and I think there's even more that's uh, still to come. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, you know, I see three major labels here. I've got scientist, libertarian, Christian. Any combination of two of these usually means you're never going to have success. You're going to be memory hold by those in the scientific or Christian fields, or not taken seriously because they can throw out a label or two to discredit you. How is it that you've succeeded to become so respected in really all three fields uh, and become a good writer and, and, and thinker, uh, despite the fact that typically any of these labels tend to clash with each other? Well, I think the primary motivation on my part that helps me to blend all these three very well is a relentless pursuit of the truth, uh, whether it is in science or in theology or in, uh, in, in uh, political theory. If one is truly committed to finding out what is good and right and true in all things, then you're going to have some success. And then from a Christian point of view, you know, if we truly believe that all truth is God's truth, then you have no fear of anything that you discover. And so when it comes to science, I've never ever felt that that has been ever been really at, uh, at odds with my faith. Uh, and I've, in fact, I, I would say that in graduate school, I, I grew in my faith through my study of science um, in a variety of ways. And in, in addition, I'd say that, you know, my study of, uh, of libertarian theory has done nothing but supported uh, so much of, of what I already believe and has strengthened, you know, my, my moral resolve and my will and my uh, my, and my commitment to finding what is true in Scripture as well. So ultimately, I think is if one is is truly willing to to head after the truth, no matter where it takes them, then you'll ultimately re end up in a good place. Now, have you actually run into you know? Obviously, there's naysayers along the way. I mean, I've I've even hit a few recently uh, in the last year or so when I've produced a few videos with some of my friends on uh, anarcho-communism. That that's just a hilarious little two-minute video debunking it, the ANCOMs. Yeah. Um, but uh, has there been any serious attempts on your uh, on your character or on your uh, on your ability to work? You know, being that you do all these things. Well, certainly not in the in my ability to work as a as a scientist. Uh, that's that has never really been an issue. Um, I I've have been I I would say there there have been a, occasional attacks on my Christian libertarian bona fides. Uh, per se, and you know those to to whatever attempt to whatever extent that they seem to be able to argue against me, I tend to be able to to rebut them fairly easily because when it comes down to it, there's really no no substantial conflict with being Christian and libertarian. Uh, there really is only people objecting because it's not conservatism or it's not liberalism in the way that they see it ought to be with regards to their theology. Um, and so. Uh, my my message, you know, to these people is that really Christian libertarianism, Christian libertarianism is the most consistent 
expression of Christian political thought that we know of right now. And the reason for this is that what we find in Scripture is that God is for those who are oppressed and is against those who aggress against others. And so we, we find that, you know, libertarianism coincides with so many of these uh, of the ideas we find in libertarian political theory uh, in, in a much better way than we than we find that conservatism does or that uh, modern liberalism does. Right. Yeah, definitely. And you know, I know you get to ask this for, you know, three thousand some odd times, but I got to <laughs> do the quick question. Give me the, the two minute Cliff Notes version. When did you decide, or when did you really get into the whole libertarianism, voluntarism, anarchism, whatever label you want to put on it? How did you get started? Was it, you know, Ron Paul? Was it just Rothbard straight up? Or, you know, did you have some kind of divine revelation? You know, there's, I've got 6,000 <laughs> different stories from so many people. What's yours? Well, as with many people, it starts with a girl. Um, in this case, however, it was not Ayn Rand. Uh, it was actually the girl who eventually became my wife. Uh, back in when we first got together, I ended up uh, reading some articles that her her dad had actually sent me from the Mises Institute, and it ta- taught me some interesting things about economics. At that time, I would have been considered a hardcore conservative, um, but I started reading these articles and got really interested in in feeling that the way that economics was being presented was was quite fascinating and it made a lot of sense to me so i started reading everything i could about the austrian school of economics and this led pretty naturally into a study of libertarianism overall and reading rothbard a lot and uh, and mises a lot and hayek a lot uh, as a result i within about a year i would after reading a ton of this stuff i began to realize man i just i just can't i just can't justify these prior held beliefs that i you know, had held for years and eventually sort of outed myself as a libertarian back in around 2005. And from then on out, it was a, you know, it was a steady growth in, uh, in my knowledge of the area and in my, uh, dare I say, radical uh, leanings towards the more anarchistic, anarcho-capitalist mentality. Um, I became fully convinced of, of anarcho-capitalism shortly thereafter in 2006 and ever since then, I've been, you know, really uh, very much convinced of that and, and have a, a particular bent towards activism and whatnot. Um, you know, I do I have supported Ron Paul. I've uh, worked in the, I worked, uh, you know, in the grassroots 2008 and 2012 campaigns and have done a variety of things, you know, to support liberty minded candidates, as well as just purely educational uh, ventures in order to promote liberty in the best way that I see fit, that I see how to do. Right, yeah, no, it, it it definitely shows. I've I've been trying to go back and sift through some of your writings, the ones that I'm, you know, quickly finding with a quick Google search, and uh, you know, even a growth, you know, from one year to another recently. Uh, you know, not that you're going through massive changes by any stretch of the imagination, but there's definitely cow, a maturation. You're, you're you're getting so much stronger. I mean, I'm not saying I'm some kind of paragon of, uh, you know, what the perfect way to form arguments are. I'm still very young in that myself, but, you know, just seeing what you're putting up out there, holy cow, man, it's, uh, <laughs> it's well, really good stuff and you're getting stronger. So, uh, definitely yeah, I, keep that up. I appreciate the compliment. I think a, a lot of, a lot of, uh, the improvements in my argumentation is due to my further study of the scriptures and of, and of just pure libertarian theory and economics, uh, and, and then uh, as well, I think this is an important point for any young libertarian out there who wants to make a mark is that you, you really have to work on your writing style and learn you know, how, to, how to form and present arguments in ways that are, that are going to be persuasive. So there's an element of, of pure rhetoric and, and just writing that is uh, something that is in a sense it's separate um, from all of these other things that we do as libertarians, as Christians, etc., um, but is absolutely critical in order to communicate well. And, and, of course, a lot of that comes with experience, too. And so the more that you can write and that you can, you can get um, you know, experience in, the, in different forms of writing and different forms of persuasive speech and whatnot, you will find that, that be, that'll, it'll improve what you're doing over time. Right, for sure. Yeah, it's, writing has been one of those things that I've never been really good at. Uh, I can... I could talk my way through anything and I could sell anybody anything off of, you know, off of their backs, frankly. But uh, getting me to write anything, it, it was always a chore to do anything in, in school <laughs> writing wise. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why. That, that's why I make videos. I'm kind of cheap like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Anand, uh, he wanted me to ask a few questions. One of them uh, is, 
who are your favorite libertarian philosophers out there today? Uh, the alive ones, preferably. Oh, well, the alive ones, preferably. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's a good question. Um, well, first off, you know, let me say that Anand is a wonderful guy, and I'm really pleased to that he made this connection for us, and uh, and I wish him all the best in his new in his new work at Indian Libertarians. That's going to be a. It's, I hope it, it, that that works out really well for him, and and I've appreciated his support overall here. Um, so some of my favorite libertarians of late. I mean, Tom Woods, of course, has been one of my favorites for a, a good while. I, I met him back at um, actually at Mises University in 2006, uh, way back when. And so <laughs> we've corresponded periodically since then, and, and have had really a great relationship, uh, working relationship together. And I, so he's definitely one of my favorites. Robert Higgs is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, definitely, you know, he's also, you know, he's a Christian as well, and has done some really cool work. Uh, and, and with his against Leviathan and whatnot, um, really seminal works. Um, I'm a big fan, of course, of uh, of Stefan Kinsella. Uh, he's a good friend of mine as well, and uh, I think he's just one of a, a very very good thinker in with regards to intellectual property and in general and property rights and the fundamentals of libertarian uh, theory and just the foundations of what we think about how libertarianism works. Uh, he's laid out in ways that I think are very very essential. Uh, a few others that I that I think are really cool are people like Gene Healy at the Cato Institute. I think he is a fantastic guy. Uh, uh, he's written some really cool stuff. His Cult of the Presidency uh, work is just is just awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess uh, there are a few others that I've probably mentioned. Of course, you know I'm, I'm I think I think the world of Lou Rockwell. Uh, he's a, he's just been a, a big supporter of what I've done in the past. Lawrence Vance is, especially with regards to Christian libertarianism, is is very critical. <laughs> and I, and I think there are a few others that you know are, are poten potentially a little less known, um, both living and uh, now gone from us, who, who deserve to be uh, lauded in the streets much more often. Um, people like John Coben, uh, who've who's written some really excellent things. Uh, as well as as Edmund Opitz, uh, who is no, no longer with us, but was a great Christian libertarian thinker, uh, very much in the classical liberal um, tradition, and, and just has written some wonderful things. And if you want to go back even farther, you know some of the the long lost people who really deserve to be part of our tradition are people like uh, David Lipscomb and Alexander Campbell, who are uh, luminaries in the Churches of Christ, where I where I spend most of my my ch my church time. And and these guys are wonderful and, and deserve to be you know remembered uh, once again and you'll find their writings here and there in the liberty tradition, um, you know you'll but but they're not as well known and and they they need to get brought back. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and speaking of of your faith and and Christianity in general, was there any particular stepping stone biblically that that really drove home, you know, anarchism, libertarianism, uh, or Really, even just your own faith uh, in reconciling, you know, the fact that we don't need a state, just God. I think that a critical point is recognizing that Romans 13, in particular, is not a a passage that justifies statism. Usually, that is the number one hangup uh, that people tend to present as a reason why they don't think that you know. Anarchist anarchist thinking is is correct even on an economic level. They have a, a essentially prejudged it out of the running simply because of those seven verses or so. And if you begin to to revisit those verses in light of the rest of Scripture, and in, and and in fact, you don't even really need to to go to the rest of Scripture to to say, well, it's not a justification of the state. But even but when you take the whole of Scripture into account. Uh, you begin to see that that Romans 13 is is not necessarily even the primary place where one should go to in order to develop a theology of the state and of power, uh, and so those I think that is a um, a really critical point that I think brings one along the pathway of seeing that the state is not justified in any way, shape, or form, whether theologically, economically, or morally. Right. Yeah. Definitely. And you know, especially when you just base it off of, uh, you know, what Christ said, uh, basically, which was love God and love your neighbor. Those were really two of his only commands outside of, a, you know, a few others. Uh, the two that I really cling most to, because when you really break it down to people like that, you realize all this hostility towards, you know, this group, that group, 
uh, and you know a proper hostility against the state uh, kind of makes sense. Uh, you, you mentioned Romans 13. Uh, you know that's a, a huge objection made by ministers and other Christians. Uh, when did this common thinking on it really take hold, and was it popular? You know, back in the the ancient times. Well, there was definitely an antipathy towards the state, um, even in the early church, mainly because, of course, that the Roman state was a was a persecutor of of Christians, um, and, and you know, and killed them, and so did you know the the local uh, authorities all throughout the Roman Empire that weren't necessarily Roman themselves. Um, whether you're talking about Herod, or you're talking about you know the the various other um, uh, governments that uh, you know that were local at the time, um, I think it you know overall the development of the nation state. Uh, is is really interesting with regards to the development of Christian faith in in Europe and beyond. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that it was uh, that I can pinpoint an exact time at which the the thinking just went kaput. Um, but we do know that for for quite a while there has been a, a mixed feelings about what Romans thirteen really does say um, and what it what it means to the active church and and you'll find. You know, whether in in, a, in Catholic writings uh, or in Reformation writings, um, some some fairly you know interesting things that that are not even what you'll typically hear said in modern day Christendom regarding Romans 13. Um, but I'd say that the that the real turning point, I suppose, uh, has to come in the 19th and 20th centuries with regards to just throwing it out there as the auto justification for why states exist and why we should just obey t- almost tacitly um, what whatever states say. Uh, it's a bit of a difference, I think, than, you know, what what has historically been held. But it does seem to be there's a there does seem to be a little bit of a ratchet effect, at least in modern commentaries, say, po- you know, in, in the modern era uh, regarding, you know, whether or not submission to, ju- to government is justified or not. Right. And that's uh, you kind of halfway answered uh, the next question uh, accidentally here, uh, which is <laughs> great. Fantastic. Uh, Anand is very fantastic at giving me questions that all kind of fit a theme and kind of follow each other fantastically. Sure. Um, and it, just for clarity, though, uh, was Christian statism really just a 20th century phenomenon? Or, uh, as you mentioned before, it, it started really a lot earlier than that. I don't – yeah, I don't think it's it's particularly unique. Uh, for one thing, you find, especially you know, in the development of the nation state in Europe, uh, an appeal to the divine right of kings. And they tend to use all sorts of different things beyond Romans 13 to even make that, you know, make that claim apparent. Um, you know, that they'll come, they'll come up with a variety of justifications for why, you know, this or that king deserves to be in power. Um, and and often it just is an appeal to history. You know, it's like, well, if God God blessed me, therefore, you know, uh, that's why I'm king. And it's very circular and silly. Um, but it is certainly the case that it, in the 19th and 20th centuries that Romans 13 has been used to justify the general form of governance of anywhere. And you'll find that it, it, it almost doesn't matter what type of government it is. They will try to use uh, gov- Romans 13 in order to justify their existence. And we see, we see this in, uh, in, in Nazi Germany, and, and we've seen it in modern day Zimbabwe. Um, who, who you know, uh, who, who have uh, their leaders have claimed that their rule is justified based on Romans 13, and so I don't think it's unique to the 20th century, um, but it, there definitely seems to be a ratchet effect, uh, you know, in, in the in the classic language of Robert Higgs, even that that there is a use of Romans 13 in order to justify their existence. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's just I. I just always cringe whenever I hear any any minister and, you know, even uh, just a couple of years ago, my father saying that (laughs) the state is justified because because of Romans 13. I'm like, uh, don't really think so, pops. Uh, Well, they say it very reflexively as as if like, you know. We have this uh, the the phrase in, in Christian thinking sometimes with of proof text, you know, where if we have an idea that we need to justify, we need to justify it quickly. Then we throw out a verse and say, "Ta-da! We made our point, and now we can move on." 
And the problem is that when it comes to when it comes to an issue as complicated as theology of the state and of power, uh, it doesn't really do it justice to you know exegetically or morally to just lean on one verse or one short section of verses to make your point. It's one thing to say Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures because that's right out of scripture, in fact. Um, but it's another to say, well, the state is justified because it says all authorities have been established by God, therefore I'm done. You know, not reading anything before, not reading anything afterwards, and not reading the rest of Scripture in order to inform that viewpoint. The problem is, is that if we go through the whole of Scripture and we start looking at, well, okay, what's the origin story of the state? Well, that's the Tower of Babel, and, and how is that the case? We have to do that exegesis, and we have to make that make it known. Um, that you know the Tower of Babel is uh, is is a essentially an archetype for the state itself, and that it's established in rebellion against God, and that that's why you know when God scattered the peoples and whatnot, and scattered the languages even, um, that this is that this is a this is a result of the fall. This is a result. Uh, you know that that pits pe uh, people against each other, and that's the res and that's how statism you know develops. Uh, and then, of course, you can go through throughout Scripture and see how awful uh, essentially governments end up becoming, almost regardless of what type or or, or who's in charge. You know, it doesn't matter. I mean, the man after God's own heart, David, still was an ad was a murderer. Uh, you know, because he had the ability to wield power. Uh, so it's not really the case that just you know that that putting just the best king you can imagine in power is going to be the solution to everything. Um, you know, it might be nice if a benevolent dictatorship really worked, but even then, you still have the problems of economics associated with it. So there's really, you know, when throughout Scripture, there's it's really hard to justify that uh, that statism is a good thing. Right. Yeah. No. For sure. And uh, this this brings us to Judges 17. Uh, there's really, as far as my brief uh, overview uh, in trying to find anything uh, anarchist uh, within the Bible, <laughs> uh, we see uh, Judges 17, verse 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And I'm glancing here at Bible.org, uh, a little series page about Judges. Uh, and here's some quick commentary. Give me a response uh, when I'm finished here. Uh, it said, this is a key verse of the book of Judges. It is likely that the expression, in those days there was no king in Israel, refers to God as king. Uh, Israel has completely ignored God's ways and instead has chosen to go their own way. The phrase, every man did what was right in his own eyes, tells the sad story of human history. Even today we live by the philosophy, if it feels right, if it seems right, do it. What's right for me must be right. Uh, so they're pulling the card of, you know, because we're all sinners and, you know, we think that, you know, we can live without any kind of overruling, you know, micromanaging authoritarian uh, that that automatically leads to being just a straight sinner that you're going to do whatever you want. You're going to go and have sex with 6,000 people. You're going to go and get <laughs> AIDS. You're going to go and murder people and kick their dog and that kind of thing. And I don't think that's the case. Uh, and I, I would assume uh, very easily that you wouldn't think that's the case. Um, what do you respond to people who think that, Judges 17 really proves the failure of anarchy and the need for a centralized state. So the first part of, of that verse, in those days Israel had no king, it, it sounded like that the commentary you were quoting was suggesting um, that the reference to king is actually referring to the kingship of God. And that may be possible, um, but it, it does seem to be the case, at least when, when you look at the writers of Judges and Chronicles and the historians who did the, who, who, who chronicled all of these events, um, that they were they were doing so in the con potentially even in the context of of having you know at that point there was a king in Israel and there, there's some reason to believe that that was when these were recorded and written down, um, and uh, you know maybe potentially by Samuel potentially by others. Um, now that being said, you know the, the it, it could just be a statement of history that there just was no king. Uh, and, and at the time in Judges, there, there there was no king, obviously. And in fact, there was one. There was a point in the Book of Judges with the with the sons of Gideon who tried to make themselves kings, and it ended up being a total disaster. Um, and it was only when it was only when essentially Samuel came uh, as the final as the final judge, and then of course you have the the uh, 
anointment of Saul um, who, to, to become the first king of Israel that you that you first find you know to be there to be a king. Right. Now yeah. the second part um, that everyone did as they saw fit. Uh, it's interesting. That there that you could come up with a variety of interpretations of this. Um, first off, it you know the punctuation that is separating it is is somewhat arbitrary. Um, one could say you know the, that uh, in those days Israel had no king uh, is is a potentially a positive statement, and that that there that the people did as they saw fit was a positive statement as well. Or you could look at it from a, for, as a negative statement in both cases. Now we're kind of doing exegesis on the fly here, and there's a lot more that we could that, that would need to be discussed and researched and whatnot. Um, but suffice to say, it doesn't seem clear off the top uh, that the statement "everyone did as they saw fit" or "as everyone d- did as they saw right in their own eyes" is um, automatically either bad or good. Um, and so, so that's I think the first point. The second is is that even if it is a bad a, a statement of, of it being bad, it does not then uh, it does not necessarily follow that the imposition of the king, uh, whether that be God or well, well I'm sorry uh, that the imposition of the king, uh, that being the the new king of Israel, would be an automatic good thing either. Um, Especially considering the way in which Israel re- retained their king, which was basically by complaining to God, and God then saying, "Okay, you know, they, you've, Samuel, they have not rejected you; they have rejected me as their king." Um, and and so there's not really a, a, a clear way of saying that that look, this is now it's a good thing that uh, that you that that we now have a king and now people can't do as they see fit or something like that. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me that that would be the case. Right. And we can, we could probably easily uh, dig into this uh, down the line. Cause I, you know, if you're willing, I'd love to have you back on maybe, you know, every couple of months uh, as you've sure. got time. Uh, and you know, maybe we might end up doing all of our recordings over the course of a week and I release it over the course of a year. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's why I love doing pre-recorded shows because I can put them out in whatever order I want and, sleep for a month and a half and not have to worry about anything um yep so we're gonna have to do some rapid fire because i know you got to go shortly um i won't give me quick 10 15 second sound bite uh what would <laughs> you say to the conservative christian who argues that there is no such thing as a victimless crime <laughs> that there's well uh it, it, it somewhat depends on what we define as a crime at that point if you know if in our in the way that we construct as libertarians the idea of crime a crime automatically has a victim because a crime is is a thing in which an event in which one person aggresses against another uh, and a commitment of an aggression means there must necessarily be a victim but what we what we also talk about when we say there are victimless crimes is that there are certain moral qualms that we have uh, that we do not necessarily believe should be legislated against. If they are legislated against, and it is an artificial creation of a crime, then in that case, with regards to to the state, there is such a thing as a victimless crime. Um, so it depends on what our definition is, but fr- uh, but frankly, there are certainly things that are immoral that should certainly not be legislated against. And it and it, who cares what the state says? Uh, if those things are, if those things do not have the 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 qualification of being aggression, then it is not something that should be legislated or criminalized. Right, definitely, definitely. Um, next next quick question, and I'm sorry to bring this dead horse back out so we can beat it some <laughs> further times. Hobby Lobby ruling, uh, obviously, it was rendered uh, as a result of supposed religious liberty. Uh, do you think the religious liberty argument is the correct one, or or is there another answer to this issue? <laughs> well, I'm glad that the Hobby Lobby case ended the way that it did. Um, you know, the the I think the the crux of the matter here is that this is just a boondoggle of state interventionism that has just gone completely insane. And and it really doesn't matter what the justification is if the right outcome <laughs> happened here. I I'm pretty much okay with that. Yes, it was done because of religious liberty, and they absolutely do have the religious liberty to uh, to um, uh, to essentially. Uh, offer benefits in the way that they see fit and people are free to either uh, employ themselves at a company in that respect or not so fine that's the, you know of course they have the religious liberty they have the economic liberty to do the same thing um, because that's that's part part and parcel of the same thing in this case um, but the but the, the libertarian position is very simple employment is at will 
These people, anybody who chooses to employ themselves at Hobby Lobby is free to do so. And Hobby Lobby is employing at will and is free to offer employment benefits and, and structures of their, of their contracts in the way that they see fit. And the convergence of those interests is the natural result of economic, uh, of economic choices, and, and people are free to engage in that how, how they will. And it's stupid to, to say that the government needs to regulate these personal relationships and contracts. Right, and we could probably do a whole show on uh, why marriage is complete shenanigans when involving <laughs> the state. Uh, we'll hit that another time. Um, sure. Yeah, and my argument on the Hobby Lobby ruling is, yeah, okay, religious liberty, great, cool, fantastic, it's a victory, woohoo! But uh, it really is the fact that, uh, as an extension of self ownership, uh, that you know, since these people own this company, they can do whatever the heck they want to do with it. Uh, yeah. Whether they want to make a mistake, and obviously they're seeing backlash, so we're, we'll see yep. uh, how that works. You know, maybe they'll have yeah. to go and and cover the final four, uh, you know, uh, contraceptives or whatever. Uh, so sure. Well, and I, I'll point we'll out see. too that there there is a lot of misunderstanding with regards to the legal aspects of that case. Yeah. And I do know of a um, a website uh, I've been involved with in the past uh, called the Libertarian Standard, which recently published an article. I can't remember exactly what the title is. Um, but it should be up and live at this point. If you go to the liber- uh, libertarianstandard.com, you can find an article that, that uh, is written by a friend of mine uh, named Max, uh, who, who will be uh, basically explains a lot of the, the more intricate legal details of the whole case, because it is more complicated than a lot of people let on. And, and yes, the religious liberty justification is in there, but exactly how that is applied with respect to the corporation and, uh, and 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 how that relates to the employment is something of a mis- of a misunderstood thing oftentimes amongst uh, even amongst libertarians. So it's an interesting article, and I recommend people go read that as well. Yeah, for sure. I will definitely throw that in the description bar below. Um, last two questions. First one: What is the greatest challenge in reaching out to Christians for libertarianism, much less anarcho-capitalism? Uh, the biggest challenge, honestly, are the 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 pre-held beliefs. Uh, that a lot of Christians have regarding regarding just the necessity of statism in, in and of itself. Um, these, it's not unlike you know what any any you know person secular uh, in the secular world uh, has as well regarding you know the necessity of statism. But but we we have an interesting problem oftentimes because of the way that they they approach it religiously, and so I think that's a big big issue, uh, which is why I I write so often about um, the, the evils of statism and why it is unjustified with respect to biblical theology. Right, yeah, no, definitely. And I, I find that it kind of shows the, the ignorance and the, the lack of reading uh, that a lot of these uh, run-of-the-mill Christians do. Uh, you know, they're the typical uh, Easter Christmas, going to show up, sit with <laughs> you, and, you know, even if their preacher's the best person in the world uh, on theology— you know, they still well, get things wrong. You know, <laughs> we should point out though. We should point out though that even you know, very devout and good people still make this mistake. And and I think it's worth noting. You know, I, I've I've had, oh my goodness, uh, you don't know how many emails I've received of people saying like, "Are you going to start your own?" you know, church at some point or another. And I'm like, no, this is not what we want to do. I'm not saying that anybody who believes differently than me is automatically a bad Christian and, you know, and is, is, uh, is going to hell or something. That, that's not what, that's not what our point is, uh, as Christian libertarians. It, what we really need to say to these people is like, you, you're not a terrible person. You're just making a mistake in your theology. Um, and if we can just present to them better arguments and better reasons to believe in this slightly different way, then we'll make a huge impact there. Um, it, because most of these people are not bad; they're not terrible people who are totally looking out, you know, to to uh, to you know, looking to the government for every answer to every problem. Now, some are, we know, and and some of these people are, you know, very much warmongers and whatnot, and we need to argue against that and show them that they're wrong. But not all these people are just – they're not awful. They're just mistaken. So how do we show them you – know, how do we show them that they're mistaken? Well, we need to – we can do it gently, and sometimes we do it strongly. Um, but we need to approach people in, in the ways that they need in order to get them – you know, per, in order to persuade them that, that uh, the way that they priorly held their belief system was, was slightly off. Right, yeah, and it's – and really all the work that I'm, I'm seeing you do and the stuff that I'm starting to – 
to read up on uh, in, in regards to your work. Uh, you're doing this as well as anybody out there. Uh, unfortunately, you haven't had quite the same effect as a you know a Tom Woods or a Lou Rockwell just yet. Uh, but I've I've got right. very high uh, hopes for you. Uh, I can see uh, <laughs> well, that you. you know probably in the next you know decade or so you're going to be as much of a household name as Tom Woods. I would hope. Uh, so definitely best of luck there. I want to open the floor up to you. Anything you want to plug? Books, events, upcoming projects, websites, uh, art, right. you know, blog posts. Throw it all out there. What do you want my listeners to be able to go and take a look at? Well, uh, I think the first thing I, I would want to mention is that we have a very exciting event coming up in less than a month in Austin, Texas, uh, called the Christians for Liberty Conference. Uh, it's a project that we've been working on for a few months. We've got an amazing lineup of speakers at this point, and people are going to be coming in from all around the country, and potentially even from out of the country, to come to to come to this event. Um, we're really excited about it, and uh, you know, I want to let everybody know that uh, our early registration deadline is actually uh, uh, J- July 13th, just an, about well two and a half days from now. And uh, and so it's really important that if you want to come and you want to pay the, re- the 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 reduced price, which is really just twenty bucks for adults and ten dollars for students. It's free for your kids if you want to bring them along, because uh, we know that's always a challenge. Uh, we want anybody and everybody to come to this because it's going to be really awesome. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't encounter a lot of Christian libertarians in their in their daily life, and so this is a chance to really fellowship with some like-minded and 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 uh, like. Uh, like-minded people it's going to be a great time and you can and all you got to do is you got to go to libertarianchristians.com slash cfl to get more information and to sign up there i uh, really want to invite you to come do that and i guess the the other thing i would invite you to do is just come and subscribe to libertarianchristians.com uh to our either our email list or to our rss feed and we hope you'll come and and uh and be a part of that and uh, get involved in that respect. And we also have Facebook groups and Twitter feeds and all sorts of things in which you can get involved in as well. So we hope that you'll uh, definitely come and do that. And we, we're constantly expanding and doing big things. Uh, we're hoping to, to that this conference also starts something really big. And uh, just we, we keep moving along and we keep plugging forward and trying to make a difference. Right. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, you know, do you have any plans for any kind of books or uh... – I know I'm kind of asking for insider information. <laughs> is there is there any secret projects that you you'd be willing to put out some information on? It's up to you. I you know say no. If well, you I I I would <laughs> I would say that probably in the near future there's going to be kind of a best of uh, LCC book that will probably come out. I don't know when that will be. It's kind of in an early stage project right now. And then we've got a few other things down the line um, that I have ideas on uh, that are that are still in such genesis of formation that it's hardly worth mentioning. But <laughs> I guess the main one being that I think a, a major project, a, a thing that needs to happen, um, is that uh, we need a essentially a new version of For a New Liberty, which was Murray Rothbard's uh, classic work written in the early 70s, but written with entirely with Christians in mind. Uh, and so that is a project that I, I foresee coming out in the long term future. I don't know how long that will take me to write it, uh, but it will it will definitely not be in the next year <laughs> unless something really changes fast. I was going to say, uh, definitely, if you uh, want to expedite that, have it be co-authored between you, Lawrence Vance and Tom Woods. Good <laughs> Lord, that would be spectacular. It, if that could happen, <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, I, I definitely would would. You know, you'd be getting a, a very interesting set of perspectives from, you know, the the Tom Woods being a Catholic, Vance being an independent Baptist, and me from the the Churches of Christ. You know, a, a, a wonderful blend of perspectives um, that would make for, I think, a really great presentation. Um, but you know, there, who knows? Something like that may come out in the future. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities there, but we're going to do the best we can. Uh, you know, with with uh, you know the promotion of libertarianchristians.com and and building up a community through that avenue and uh, to where we can you know in a sense build a tribe that will go out and make a difference in their churches all throughout all throughout the world yeah no for sure and uh i wanted to let you know and i'm going to ambush you on air here uh if you ever need uh i know you've you've got the much larger audience compared to me but if you ever just want to <laughs> throw out a video and you want some place to put it and you don't really feel like setting up your own YouTube channel or you know uploading it through your website or whatever 
let me know. I am more than happy to throw up there whatever you want. Uh, you know, and I do this for all of my my guests because you know you guys are really what's making me uh, and my channels and my uh, the places that I work at uh, online uh, really expand and grow. And your readership and my viewership combined can work together to do fantastic things. Uh, so you know, offer, take it or leave it. It's going to be on the table until we're both dead, and hopefully we can have people <laughs> to pick it up after we're both gone. Um, but, uh, I guess that's going to wrap anything, wrap everything up. Got any, uh, final sentiments for my, uh, for my viewers here? Well, Adam, I just thank you so much for letting me come on your program and talk a little bit. And I'm sure we'll have, uh, further, further fruitful discussions in the future. And I'm really excited to see what you're doing and wish you all the best. And again, just wish, uh, wish everyone, all your listeners the best as well. And hope you'll come to our, the Christians for Liberty conference and come visit us at libertarianchristians.com when you get a chance. Yeah, for sure. Thanks a lot, Norman. Uh, we had again. This is Norman Horn, uh, libertarianchristians.com. You can also find out more about him at normanhorn.com. It's a quick, simple little website, but you know, it gives you all access to all of his other stuff. Uh, so go check it out. Uh, check out that uh, that conference on libertarianchristians.com. Uh, yeah, this is Lee Adams signing off, saying peace and love and liberty.